Hello, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Lecture 10 of Environmental Science 1401. And what we're going to be looking at today is um, hazardous waste. Basically, how do we identify and characterize hazardous and toxic materials? And then how do we keep them under control and how do we use them? And basically, eventually go into um, the disposal of hazardous waste and hazardous waste that we use around the household. So uh, to begin with, uh, when we start looking at hazardous and uh, toxic materials, and these we'll see later has very specific definitions. Um, they're part of our modern life. I mean, these are things that we cannot avoid. And they're found in almost literally every product that we use, and particularly in the electronic devices. Um, we see that these are found, uh, that toxic materials actually do get released either purposely or accidentally, you know, literally globally. So. Um, we see this not only in developed countries, but also in developing nations. And we're going to learn that uh, governments uh, are, over time, are learning to make more and more rules, not only in our country, but internationally, uh, setting rules and standards that protect people and also the environment uh, from hazardous materials. So before we go anywhere, what we have to understand is that there's a the potential for hazardous and toxic substances in, in literally every product that we use. And in the business world and manufacturing world, there's a concept called a product life cycle or life cycle. And, and what this basically means is that when we build a product, um, what is involved in the making that product? Who is the product for? You know, basically what are we making it for and how long does a person use that product or an entity like an industry? And then how is that product uh, disposed of? And there could be various ways of disposing of it, either selling it through the used market, uh, recycling the material, or just basically, you know, throwing it in the trash. So with hazardous uh, materials, we have to be really careful about this because of um, uh, growing regulations that, that um, identify and limit the amount of hazardous materials that can get out into the environment. So we're not just looking at exposure of people, but also exposure of um, organisms um, to environmental contamination, either in the product or through particularly product disposal. So we're going to see that when we use these terms, it's very important to understand the concept of toxic. And toxic uh, uh, materials really belong to a very narrow category of materials that cause injury or human death. And these are materials that act on your uh, what we call your biochemistry. They could alter body function. They could be very short-term effects, very long-term effects. Hazardous materials include toxic. It's a broader range, but usually refers to some type of um, physical damage that we can do to the body, like electrocution, burning, um, corrosion, which means that you actually eat away the flesh, which sounds kind of pretty, you know, whatever. And this could even include, uh, I hate to say, it's even uh, uh, drowning hazards and things like this. So this is, again, a very broad variety. When we look at the product life cycle, what we see here is kind of uh, not so much a flow chart, but what happens to a product, you know, from this, some what we call the research and development stage. That means when we're formulating that product. And any time a product is made, particularly when it has hazardous waste, we have to understand that industry today, and, and, and this is almost true globally, it, 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 you know, wants to limit the amount that has this material that goes into the, the you know, their products. And, and a lot of this is practicality. A lot of this is also cost of why we, they do this, because there, there are disincentives for um, dealing with hazardous materials as far as uh, protecting workers and uh, protecting the public and protecting the environment. So in the research and development stage, what they do is they look at this overall picture of um, product life cycle, and particularly with hazardous materials, they have to pay attention to where are those hazardous materials going? And sometimes we call this cradle to grave um, uh, philosophy. That means when the product is being born, literally in the R&D stage, is where are the hazardous materials going and where are they gonna end up that can be a problem for the company and a problem for people, a problem for the environment. So during this stage, they determine, do we need a hazardous material or not? And how's that hazardous material in the product that affect the world? And then we look at the manufacturing stage. So manufacturing has to, particularly when it contains hazardous materials, has to be well aware that there has to be a limited exposure again to workers and to the environment. 
And eventually, you know, uh, when they have to dispose of these hazardous materials, what are the proper procedures for doing this? And then eventually products get stored. And sometimes excess hazardous materials get stored, particularly waste. So a lot of companies end up with a lot of hazardous waste just in the manufacturing product uh, project in itself. So um, this all has to get stored. And there are a lot of regulations on where you can store these things. And there have been horror stories about this in the time I've been involved in environmental science and environmental policy. Um, so there are regulations about where we can store it, how we can store it, how long and how much. And this is all taken into consideration in what's called this life cycle. And then there's transportation. And transportation basically means from the stored product and sometimes directly from the manufactured product to a truck, train or plane. And then how is that regulated and how much of that can we ship and where? Because when you start talking about what's called hazardous waste or hazmat transportation, um, this is very tricky when they load those trucks, trains and planes. And planes in particular are, are, are highly restrictive on the type of uh, cargo they can carry. So this is a big issue when making a product and then making sure that when that product is in transportation, is it uh, well known to the public that this transportation contains that material, this we'll learn later is called communication. And also, uh, what's the probability of that material getting out to the environment if an accident occurs? And then there's the use. And this is where in industries, when they use products that contain hazardous materials or machinery that requires hazardous materials, uh, industry is well regulated on, on what they do with those materials and where those materials go to prevent any release of uh, any component into the environment. Households are not regulated. And this is a whole issue called household hazardous waste. Because you're gonna learn that about half the darn products in your house, at least half, probably cause some type of environmental or human harm that they can't just be disposed of down the toilet, in your yard, or down the driveway in a sewer system, or you know uh, into the air or into a landfill, a regular landfill. And this particularly leads to, again, the disposal issue. When a product is made, how often is it going to be disposed? When we start looking at product lifespans, uh, things like computers at one time, guys, you know, they lasted, they were meant to last five, six years. Now they're almost on a two year cycle before they get unusable, particularly laptops. Uh, cars at one time were built on a 10 year product life cycle. Now I'm, I see friends that get crazy when they don't have a car every two years and I'm happy to be driving my old clunker car. You know, um, but what's funny about this too, when they do design these longevity items is when we look at consumer buying, this helps sometimes determine when is this object going to be thrown out. Like for example, cell phones, we're encouraged now to get one almost every year, literally. You know, so when we look at hazardous waste and when I mean materials and they're built into products how does that hazardous material become a hazardous waste is a very 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 fundamental concept that, that we have to pay attention to in designing our society now one of the primary issues when dealing with hazardous waste is a concept called communication and this comes under the category of identifying 50, 60 years ago, we didn't have to worry about that. You just put hazardous materials on a truck, on a train, on a plane, and it went places. And you can have hazardous materials in anything with no labeling whatsoever. We've become universally cautious now. I mean, literally globally aware that we have to label in a way that everybody understands what's going on, and particularly people responding to hazardous waste situations, what we call uh, first responders or emergency responders. So we're gonna see here that the United Nations, these are called UN placards, and sometimes DOT, Department of Transportation placards, right here. This is a universal sign of labeling using pictures and colors and numbers which a truck driver that handles this stuff has a book of numbers, or you can have an app for it, where this identifies what that chemical is to the minimum identification. That means sometimes we have to know the type of hazard. For example, is it a poison? Okay, is it what we call uh, explosive or ignitable? Is it flammable? Uh, is it a gas? 
you know, is it what we call corrosive? So we use these placards to identify what's in there and sometime write down to the individual chemical because each chemical is given its own United Nations number. And there are again books, you know, that you can get that have this. Every, almost every truck stop sells these books in paper form or again, you can get it online. Um, we could also communicate, and this is true on buildings and sometimes items, you know, uh, in this way. And this is uh, the way the uh, fire department uh, uh, communicates hazard. And you sometimes see these on even cleaning closets. You'll see these in restaurants and whatever, usually on the cleaning room or in the kitchen. And, and these numbers usually deal with the severity of the hazard. And then you can see the colors here, the blue, the red, uh, and the yellow, and the white will ju is just called um, special category. And that usually gives some type of symbol that you have to look up or is on a chart. But this talks about the effects of that chemical on health, its flammability, and what's called its reactivity. That means how does it respond to different environments, like too much oxygen, because some things are explosive in the presence of oxygen, some in water, and some you don't want to react with acids or bases or other things, or with metals, because some materials in contact with metals cause uh, damage or ignition. So communication is the number one way we deal with hazardous materials. And that means we communicate you know, to whoever's using that product and also who's ever shipping that product. And, and in general, you know, just everybody that has some stake in that product. So how do we classify hazardous waste? And this is the most frustrating part of doing environmental science and particularly my field of environmental toxicology is, you know, I have my own ways I learned of identifying pollutants by their chemical structure. And some people look at their physical structure, but we don't use that type of uh, categorization to identify what is a hazard and what is not. What we usually do is look at uh, um, its hazardous effect on humans. And this is primarily true for what the EPA does and what's called the National Institutes of Health and you know first responders. Is there concern about how does this help hurt a human and in what way? The EPA and the UN are also interested in the environmental aspect. So sometimes we have to classify based on the recipient of this harm. So it could be plants are the recipient. It could be materials are the recipient. It could be humans. It could be frogs and fish because they all respond differently to a hazard or to a type of harm. So in general, what the EPA does is they make these very broad sweeping categories of what they consider the most important properties that make a material a hazard universally to anything. That means materials and organisms, humans, or well, we're organisms, but whatever, non-human organisms. So we look at this factor called ignitability. And basically that just means how does this thing burn and under what conditions? Because guys like flower dust, wheat dust can burn under ideal conditions and just ignite. I mean, ignite itself just due to the heat of it being present in the air. Uh, um, corrosiveness just basically means when this material is in contact with metal, with skin, with whatever, does it eat away the molecular structure? Uh, and car batteries are an excellent example, the lead acid battery. The material in there, guys, will dissolve away your flesh in seconds. And what's really weird about it, uh, when it does happen, at first you feel a little heat, then you feel nothing, because basically what it did was eat away your skin and eat away the nerves that feel pain and sensation in the skin. And at that point, man, you start eating away the muscle and bone. And I noticed from experience in industry getting exposed to a corrosive material that literally uh, ate through the protective clothing because the clothing wasn't right for the, the materials misidentified. So it wasn't right for the material and literally ate a hole and ate away some of the flesh in my lower leg. And luckily it was only below the knee because I had splashes on top and luckily the suit was loose because it could have caused a lot more damage. So these are, you know, uh, these are very important category of materials. And then there's reactives. And these are things that can explode. So of course, dynamite, but even things like fertilizer under the right conditions could explode. And we saw this in Waco several years ago with an explosion at a fertilizer plant. And there are other chemicals that fit that category too, uh, like petrol and other things, which can be both ignitable and explosive. 
And then we have toxicity. And again, this is a relative category. That means there's a big difference if you're a fish, a frog, or a plant. You know, but toxicity, you know, basically means causes biological harm. Okay. And, and or and and some chemicals actually when released in the environment, they themselves are not toxic, but their byproducts are. That means it can release toxins also from their decay or from their ingestion. So um, again, these are important property categories that say, what kind of harm could this do? But as you see here, some things like gasoline, for example, fall into several categories. It could be toxic if you drink it. It's very reactive. It's also very ignitable because it can flash to, uh, uh, at certain air temperatures or at certain concentrations. I mean, I've seen gas, I've seen what are called acetone explosions where people were pumping this chemical called acetone, which is related to nail polish remover, and it just ignited around this person. And luckily it was a it was a cold flame because all it basically did was singe their clothes and singe off the hair off their exposed body. And then again, you know, uh, gasoline can be corrosive to plastics. So in this case, it fits all the categories. Now, um, we're going to learn a little later is that when we start identifying hazardous wastes, certain things don't appear to be hazardous to us, and particularly things in a household. Industry is well aware of this. They have to label it. When I was in industry, we had to label every darn little bottle and box, no matter how small it was in every area, had to have an inventory and it had to be a sheet available to the fire department. So when they walked into our facility, they knew where everything was and what it was and they know what room contained what. And anything that was out of place, we can get fined for. So that means when we move something from point A to point B, there better have been a designation that it was there. Okay, and so when we look at hazardous materials, but you know, we can see that many materials we don't think of as hazardous can be harmful to the environment and to people. And this includes things like plastics, which we don't really pay attention to, including the plastic bottles have some harm to them, particularly when they're disposed. And we know this from the plastics that accumulate in the ocean in the form of what are called microplastics and also those gyres, those chunks of floating trash because it's not one giant gyre it's actually chunks of just floating plastic trash you know in the pacific and also um in other oceans so this is really these are releasing toxic materials pesticides we know is obviously medicine any type of medicine is considered a hazardous material particularly when thrown out it becomes a hazardous weights paints in liquid form except for lead paint is toxic in its uh, dried form, but most paints when they're dried are not considered hazardous. Uh, uh, Oil-based paints can be partially harmful because they can be degrade and release toxins. Then there's oils and gas. Most metals that we deal with today are toxic. Leather can be toxic, believe it or not, because the way it's manufactured is with hazardous materials that actually still stay in the metal. There are cleaner ways of tanning leather that's it's a tanning process that does that and i actually did a project uh, i completed in bangladesh where we were trying to clean up the tannery industry there because they're the major them in india and, Ch and parts of africa and china are major exporters of tanned leather to around the world and and they have to use toxic materials to preserve the leather so we're trying to work that out so that means if you bought a leather jacket and threw it in the trash that is not legal you have to pay attention, and that is a potentially hazardous material. And then there's uh, uh, textiles, clothing, and sometimes even uh, paper print can contain eat, inks, dyes, and other materials that we consider harmful. So when we look at sources of toxic materials, that means who's releasing toxic materials? A and sometimes this is accidental. A lot of times it's purposeful because it's permitted by law to put out a certain amount. We used to do this in industry. We just assumed it would dilute or spread out. Okay, so when we look at the industries, we can't point the finger totally on industry. We also have to pay attention to that, that uh, a, a concept called household hazardous waste. And unfortunately, uh, um, that is really kind of not on this chart. Because household hazardous waste, we're finding out per ton, 
is uh, is exceeding that of the releases that occur in industry. So when we start pointing fingers, because this is called a point source, when we point fingers at industry, they're doing a lot to reduce, believe it or not. And this is actually becoming a global ex, uh, effort thanks to global trade, because with global trade, other countries, particularly the EU, uh, European Union is demanding that if we get a product, we want it to be made clean, environmentally clean, even the country of origin. So the uh, United States doesn't push that as much, but we're getting there. Okay, so when we look at households, this is an old, its own pie chart in itself. And, and if we were to compare a pie chart of industry to households, we'll see that households far exceeds what comes out of industry. But from industry, we're going to see that metal mining is, a, is approximately about 40%. I mean, this number can vary from year to year. It's just an average. But uh, mining for metal. Guys, we're metal hogs. We use it a lot. Even though metal, a lot of metal is replaced by plastic, it's still very common. Our cities are based on metal. You know, electronics devices are still based on the need for metal. And metal is a very dirty business, which is why we don't like doing it in this country. And we tend to... Um, outsource it and import it. Uh, governments like uh, China, they know it's a dirty industry and their people suffer for it, but they have to do it and they have to lax environmental regulations. We'll learn that um, in another lecture uh, because if they don't, it gets too expensive and then people, uh, other countries don't want to buy it. So we tend to outsource a lot of material at the consequence of other countries becoming more contaminated. And we don't see that contamination here. We don't see those releases. And this was the horror of the project I did in Bangladesh. We were seeing people uh, dying, becoming deformed, and, and living with chronic illnesses, all due to the fact that in the United States, we would never tolerate the type of uh, 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 um, industries that run the tanning and the type of toxic releases that occur as a result and a consequence of that type of uh, uh, operation. Electric utilities. Now, this is where we can blame us. Most electricity goes into running households. Okay, industries come later. And what's really funny is even before industries comes commercial entities that serve us as far as households. I mean, it's grocery stores, recreational places, you know, where you get your hair cut, whatever. So these are the two big guys, and these are the ones we pay a lot of attention to and heavily regulate, at least in the United States. And sometimes we can't heavily regulate them, particularly here, because if we put too much regulation and expect too much pollution control here, toxic release control, this makes electricity unaffordable to the public. And then is what's called primary metals, and this basically means, uh, uh, um, you know, metal remanufacturing reuse so that means once the metal is is mined and cleaned okay uh, um that itself produces hazardous releases like for example cleaning gold out of rock requires arsenic to make it into a primary source metal a pure metal chemical industries okay major part paper believe it or not is uh, the production of paper not only the manufacturing paper, but also the use of paper results in a lot of toxic releases. Funny enough, our own ability to handle hazardous waste produces as much hazardous waste release and pollution uh, as paper production. Food and beverage industry, this includes agriculture. They're not that big, funny enough. We always think of agriculture as a big polluter of toxic materials, but they're really not. Uh, and they've cleaned up uh, too, thanks to uh, uh, strict federal regulations, and particularly regulations where we want to keep those chemicals out of the food. And, and the tobacco industry is kind of small. Now, cigarettes in themselves are a hazardous material that should not be thrown out on the street. But again, uh, this is still a pretty short, uh, small sector in the U.S. Now, in other countries, it's a big problem where you get literally 100 times more people smoking than you find in the United States, and particularly concentrated in urban areas. And the other just includes other stuff. I mean, other things that we do that produce hazardous releases, like dry cleaners, things like that, certain commercial entities. Now, this takes us back to the lecture we had on risk.
Again, when we look at hazmat risk, and that means hazardous materials, that's what we call it in the business. And sometimes we call it now HM. I've seen this now. I'm reviewing an article that somebody, a chapter somebody's uh, writing for a book I'm editing. And uh, they use HM, and I'm like, okay, not everybody knows this one, so you're going to have to write out hazmat or hazardous materials for the, for the audience of the book. So when we look at hazmat materials, really what we care about is this concept called exposure. And that means exposure means is this chemical in contact with you, another material, a plant, an animal, an environment, and is it in contact in a way that it can cause harm. That means literally you drink it, eat it, inhale it, whatever. So when we look at hazmat risk, what we're doing is preventing the risk that this thing will cause harm. Okay, now we can look at again the concept of likelihood. That means if it comes in contact with you, will this material cause harm? Or in, in the computer, if there's a hazardous material and it's contained inside this unbreakable box, What's the likelihood of that unbreakable box coming out and causing exposure? So this is kind of individual for each product. And again, we have this thing called almost certain to rare. And then we have the consequence because each has this material and toxin has its own effect on the body and different concentrations have different consequences. So a low concentration could be insignificant. A high concentration can cause catastrophic damage. That means like death and sometimes death to a lot of people. So what we do in product life cycle and also in, pro in, in hazardous waste disposal is we try to find a happy medium. And that means what we try to do when we're building a product is we try to keep that product in what's called the green zone. That means that there's a very low probability that that hazardous material will come in contact with a person, environment, and object and cause harm okay a lot of harm this you don't want to have that literally means short exposure short death when we dispose of wastes this is typically what we try to aim for because we can't have a hundred percent safety and some products we aim for here like a lot of household chemicals is that bleach guys we actually have this category right about here household bleach as long as it's in a container and you use it properly it's okay <coughs> excuse me but um if you spill it on yourself or dump it you know in in a driveway or into a yard it will it will cause harm and there's a pretty good probability of you having it in a house it will so this chart is you know goes into this whole idea of hazardous materials how we ship them how we store them how we use them in a product and how we dispose of them. So how do we manage health risks associated with toxic substances? What, what, and, and actually this is how do we measure it in a way? How do we categorize it? So when we look at uh, um, uh, risks, okay, what we can do is look at what's called acute or chronic risk. And guys, usually we refer to this with toxicity, but it's not necessarily true. But generally when a harmful you know, material comes in contact with you, does it have an immediate effect? That's called acute. Does it have a chronic effect? That means long term. Usually large exposures can have an acute effect. It's this part is not necessarily true and small doses is over time can have a chronic effect but there are some things that just naturally cause a chronic effect like certain chemicals found I hate to say this in certain plastic materials that you drink out of and eat out of and eat with and have around the house they can leak out a substance that can affect your endocrine system and particularly in it, it can affect how estrogen is regulated in the body it can actually elevate your your estrogen levels and act like estrogen in the body, which for females, that can induce breast cancer and infertility. In men, it can cause um, decreased testosterone, uh, feminization in young boys. It can actually cause birth defects uh, during sexual development uh, 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 as the child undergoes uh, development and puberty. So uh, acuteness and chronicness are very important.
we try to aggressively avoid chronic uh, acute harm. Chronic harm sometimes occurs so slowly we don't know it. And uh, in the person, and this is a problem because chronic effects can take months to a lifetime to show up, and this is a very difficult thing to look at. And there's a concept then called synergism. Synergism just means what happens when two compounds are used together, disposed of together, or you're exposed of together in the body. And that means two what appears to be low probability harm materials, when they work together, they can cause incredible harm. And, and, and this is very true, I hate to say this, of a lot of cooking utensils and also plastics. What you store in them or cook in them can actually react with chemicals in the plastic that produce a substance that's more harmful than the chemical in the plastic and more harmful than the materials in the food. Like for example, tomatoes, the acid in the food won't harm you. But if it comes in contact with a copper pot, it can, it can leach the copper out of the pot and form a toxic copper substance that can harm you. And in women, it could be passed on to the child. Okay, what we also do is look at what's called uh, harm persistence. That means, will this chemical, will this thing stay in the body temporarily? Does it go away? Does it break down quickly? Or does it stay around? So for example, arsenic, when it's in water, it eventually diffuses and it can go away. It can wash away. And when it's in your body, you can sweat and pee a lot of it out and poop a lot of it out. When we look at something called dioxins, okay, uh, uh, or polychlorinated biphenyls, or things called VOX, volatile organic compounds, a lot of these are found in, in water and products and in air pollution. I mean, these things can stay around in the environment for years. Certain things take 100 years to 200 years to break down, okay, and some of them just persist in your body. And we have to pay attention to that because persistent pollutants or particularly hazardous pollutants can have long you know chronic effects eventually and sometimes in an environment they can build up and cause um, an acute effect after a while and we see this in areas particularly in petrol areas where, where there was a lot of illegal or pre-law dumping going on where the chemicals in the soil slowly over time built up and built up and built up the toxic levels for both plants animals and humans and then there's what we call non-persistence that just means stuff that doesn't remain around Okay, it doesn't mean it's not dangerous. It just means eventually it could go away or diffuse or dilute to the point where it uh, has a low probability of harm. Now, one thing you're not going to like, this whole idea of what's called setting exposure limits. Okay, what, just because you come in contact with or see or around a harmful substance it doesn't mean it's going to cause harm you have to be literally exposed and exposed is depending on the type of material like uh, um you know if i was to spill something on your skin that is not harmless to your skin but you drink it it can be harmless pouring it on the skin is not exposure unless you lick it off your skin pouring it into your mouth is exposure. So when we look at exposure, you know, with each product has a different way of how it's exposed to the body. And we have products that are hazardous when they're inhaled. So the gas, it could be a gas, it could even be a evaporating liquid, uh, it could be a powder. I've seen people inhale toxic powders in the industry by accident when some of it fluffed up into the air and they weren't wearing appropriate uh, protective equipment. So um, you can inhale something, it can get into your lungs, into your bloodstream and cause harm, or you could even irritate your respiratory lining. Consumption, eating, is a way you could be exposed and also absorption. That means this stuff dissolving right into your skin, and I hate to tell you this, when you're in water, it can even dissolve into your anus and into your mouth, the lining of your mouth and your ears and your eyes. So, and some harmful material, you can consume it, but it won't go through your intestine into your body. But if it does absorb, then you have a problem. So what we do is we set, we set 
things called thresholds to determine harm. And we determine a certain amount of illness that a person can tolerate. We'll see that a little later. But a threshold just says that for this chemical, we don't want people inhaling a certain amount of it or consuming a certain amount of it or absorbing it. And for almost every chemical that has a potential hazard that is sold, including table salt and even water you can run into too with uh, uh, um, uh, looking at these factors, we set a limit of how much you should become exposed to, not around, but exposed to, or what gets in your bodies. And this is tested, of course, on animals and cell cultures. We're moving away from animals. And it's also tested in computer models that, that are literally like virtual humans. So we've learned when we start setting exposure limits, literally everything is toxic in a high enough level. Water is toxic if you drink too much or if you drown in it. You know, uh, so, you know so, so when we look at life in general, anything can cause harm. And, and it's not always easy to establish acceptable levels because some things we've never seen reach a toxic level. But when we deal with obvious harmful materials, what we do as a society is we first of all determine the type of harm it can cause and the threshold. Then we look at what's called permissible exposure limits. Guys, we can't have zero permissible limits. I worked on a committee once where I tried to set zero as a threshold for hazardous waste use and production in the Houston metropolitan area. It was part of a document called Houston Foresight Hazards Group. I led the group and actually helped uh, wrote most of the book. You know, it was uh, uh, like 50, 60 pages of document, just recommendations on, on what we should do with Houston to reduce and even just not use at all hazardous materials. And it turned out to be almost impossible. We got a lot of negative criticism on it, but also a lot of good comments that it, it is something that we can start looking to in the future. And it was part of an overall project, you know, by a group called Houston Foresight to deal with this, you know, a Houston Foresight Committee out of what's called the, the Advanced Research Council out of the Woodlands. So permissible limits just means here's a harmful material. I know what it does. So how much harm could I induce in a person before I have to start worrying about this person is harm to the point where it's socially unacceptable? And guys, as this is when you if, when you start traveling to developing countries, you have to understand that they have different permissible exposure limits. When I was working overseas, um, I was exposed to deadly worms, dangerous worms. And I still carry some tropical diseases that I've picked up along my travels. And when I was overseas, I was given a drug called ivermectin. Ivermectin is not given in the United States because the permissible exposure limits for any doses that would treat the worms is harmful to people. We give it to dogs with the assumption that it does harm the dog and can take five, you know, years off a dog's life, but is better than dying acutely from a worm infection, particularly heartworm, and you eventually getting worms from the dog. So in, in overseas, the permissible limits for ivermectin are so high that literally it's given all the time, kids, whatever. And some researchers are still looking at its toxic doses in humans in those countries to make sure that we don't ever overdose a person. Because it does make you sick, but enough of it will outright kill you. And then we have what are called short-term exposure limits. Okay. This is, uh, uh, you know, it just means something blows up on my face. I spill something on me quickly. What's the limit for that? And then what's called a time weighted average. And this is a weird calculation that looks at over time as your body's exposed, you know, over your lifetime, what's the average exposure a person could take. And we, and we do this with x-rays. Uh, when you get an x-ray, they can only give you a certain amount of x-rays a year. And you should really only have a certain amount in your lifetime. This is called a time-weighted average before you start seeing harm. And what they do is they look at the benefits of an x-ray versus the harm. And this has really been, and this is an environmental system itself because our houses are always producing radiation. Some products produce radiation. We're surrounded by it from the atmosphere. So we don't want to add to that burden of radiation. So we have to look at the cost and benefit of that with this time-weighted average thing. And a lot of women are running into problems, particularly with breast cancer, 
is that if you're exposed already to a lot of radiation, you know, you go through airports or do whatever, you fly in a plane, you know, we have to be careful. Is a breast x-ray going to cause environmental harm to that woman by giving enough exposure that that's the time when it average that could induce cancer? And then we have what are called ceiling limits. It means as a society, we don't ever want this level to be around and we try to prohibit it. So again, what we're looking at is permissible harm. And keep that in mind, guys, that our country, we don't want to see a lot of harm caused to a person. But in other countries, they can tolerate more harm because sometimes it's a cost benefit situation. So we can have high taxes, high prices to products relatively by making sure that we have permissible exposure limits that our lifestyle is very safe and secure. Okay, just to go into a couple of regulations, probably the most important regulation that came about about seven years after the beginning of the uh, uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and once the Environmental Protection Agency got some teeth, that means once they got some regulation power, because initially they really can just make recommendations and do studies. So once they became uh, more regulatory, they started producing guidelines right around the, the, the middle 70s that really looked into this whole idea of hazardous material usage and, and storage and release. And a lot of this was brought about by the, you know, the, the hippie movement, the environmental movement, green movement, whatever you want to call it. And it really made us scrutinize, okay, this whole life cycle of hazardous materials and product development that involves hazardous materials. And, and what came up with was something called the Resource Conservation Recovery Act, or RECRA is what we call it. Because RECRA sounds like Scooby-Doo talking, so whatever. But um, what this did is it get, the EPA it gave them the responsibility for regulating hazardous waste. And, and Environmental Protection Agency, guys, I want you to know, does research. They also con they use research from universities, too, and they even help give grants. I've had EPA grants along that line, so they do give grant money. And they research hazardous materials particularly. You know, what happens to the environment, what is hazardous, what is not. And what the EPA has done with a lot of that research is created what was called, I mentioned earlier, the cradle to grave type of concept. Is we have to be careful of hazardous grace, uh, hazardous waste, I mean materials, from the point where we get it out of the ground or make it to the point where it's used and shipped and eventually disposed and, and to the point where it gets to be a waste. So, uh, and this includes a lot of things that, uh, that you don't even think about in everyday life, gasoline tanks, all this stuff, you know, trucks, uh, uh, even motors contain hazardous materials and, and things. And all these things are regulated and looked at and recommendations made by the EPA. So anytime a company uses or makes these things or you use them or, or, or throw them out, the, the, there are regulations that say how any materials that are hazardous, you know, are limited from getting out into the environment or getting out and causing harm to you. And, and part of the uh, RECRA Act also helps to categorize waste. And they also work with other agencies to set uh, um, medical limits. They work with what's called the Centers for Disease Control or the National Institutes of Health, or a group called Underwriting Lab, also looks at harm due to many devices and works with the EPA on that. So when we look at uh, RECRA, Okay, again, it looks at our whole aspect of society, how we use hazardous materials in everyday life, and then how could we safely, you know, use them, or if we can't, how do we reduce their usage? And they're particularly, again, focusing on disposable, disposal. What happens when these materials get into the environment and end up where they shouldn't belong? So this is a kind of a little complex chart, but it's just basically saying again, what is happening to any product or any hazardous material? Where is it going? And this is the principle called traceability. And when I was in industry, we start, just started getting uh, 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 traceability from any of the chemicals we we're working with. And that meant, man, every time I used it, I had to say everywhere it went, what product it went into, you know, uh, did, did some of it go down the drain? How do I dispose of it? You know, how do I store it? And it was a real pain in the butt because we had to make sure that everybody down the line recorded where that product went eventually even to the consumer. And then from the consumer, 
we had to know what landfill that would end up in, uh, you know, because eventually somebody would find out. And if it was disposed of inappropriately, my company actually would have been responsible for part of it because we weren't communicating the nature of how to work with that product, including even its disposal to a consumer we've never seen or even might not even known would be using that product. So this is all part of RECRA and it is a very powerful act. What's unfortunate is is um, industries would rather not have a lot of it around because it is very expensive to maintain and involves a lot of people power to carry out the tasks of doing record. Some companies, they can spend up to 25% of their budget on environmental compliance. So it is very expensive and, 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 and nobody wants to be an intentional polluter, but, but industries tend to look at different permissible levels of risk than politicians might or then the public might and, and politicians in general tend to set their standards usually on on who their lobbyists are that are stakeholders in the RECRA Act and then we have something oh, you're gonna love this called uh, CERCLA and this is more of once an incident occurred pre requa and post requa once something occurred where there is a harmful situation in the environment that could damage the environment, damage humans, and, and, and be transported to other areas and spread that harm, your federal government set aside some money on what's called the SARA Act, and nobody calls it SARA. We call it Superfund. I don't know why, but I guess it just because there are other things called SARA too, I guess, or whatever. Uh, so Superfund just basically means that there's a pot of money nice pot of money and this is the united states other countries may have something similar i'm not too familiar with it but i doubt it so what happens is the federal government puts away a certain amount of tax money into the federal budget that cannot be touched it is meant to supplement the cleanup of a current waste or past waste and we have companies that have past waste that we were suing back to stuff that they dumped in you know the, the, the 1950s as long as that company's still around and if that company was bought by another company that company that bought the other company has to pay so this is an act that says we're going to clean up our friggin environment and guys what we have these things called super fun sites which means these are condensed areas houston has a lot of them in texas in general but condensed areas where hazardous materials are built up either for storage inappropriately stored that is were dumped illegally or legally at the time and, and, and are a mess and they're causing harm and we don't want them in the environment particularly ones that we don't encounter anymore that have been banned so the superfund is a very important principle and what and unfortunately other countries do not have this i've seen uh, areas in the philippines and in south america central america uh, uh, where you know they had no superfund type law and they have these toxic pits toxic environments, I mean, even around houses, you know, urban areas that are just unlivable and they have no money set aside to do anything about it and they can't get companies to do so because it's just because it would, it would affect commerce. So this is a, a very important law that we are lucky to have as a country, but it is a very punitive law. And one thing I want you to do for fun is, is go to this website and please just do it. I mean, I'm not going to require it, but please do it and look up uh, you, what you can do is go to the website and look up um, on this search engine right down here. Type in your state. And look at nearby super fun sites that are on a map so you can look anywhere. You can look at where you grew up. You can look at where relatives live. You can look anywhere in the United States, whatever you're curious about. And you're going to be surprised. So these are sites that means either have stored chemicals that are going to be used for manufacturing and are stored improperly or waste that were dumped either legally again at the time or, in, or illegally. And they are causing problems. There's just too much, too little, and some of them are leaking out, blah, blah, blah. Harvey brought out a lot of Superfund sites because some Superfund sites were flooded by Harvey and cause incredible leaking, including one you will find in here on the Houston Ship Channel.
So super, so please look this up. It's nice to know your environment, guys, and know that you're near a hazardous waste pit. And some of you might be five miles from one, particularly if you live around the Conroe Woodlands area. Now I just scared you. Okay. So guys, when we start looking at hazardous materials, um, how do we prevent a hazardous material becoming a hazardous waste? And this is the goal of society, the goal of industry. And I think this is you know, uh, um, something I find more important than any other aspect of this, because we tend to worry about it as a waste. Well, let's not let it become a waste, is the modern philosophy, what we call a sustainable or green philosophy. And the United States is pretty good about this. Developing nations are not that much. And again, a lot of it is the cost and just the mentality of how people think. And we'll learn this later when we look at uh, environmental uh, 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 policy and economics. So, Typically, what we try to do is we look at this pyramid, and this pyramid means what we should be doing, and this is what we probably don't want to do to uh, uh, you know, deal with hazardous waste. So in this part up here, what we're looking at are strategies that prevent hazardous waste, I mean materials, from becoming a waste. And that means don't allow it to get out, or even in some cases, don't use it, reuse it, recycle it. And you'll see that a little below. For here, sometimes a hazardous byproduct or excess hazardous materials can be sold to other entities. And this is particularly true in the petrol industry and in the uh, uh, car manufacturing industry, well, I should say transportation manufacturing industry, is a lot of your hazardous waste gets traded because one person's waste is another person's product. Petrol production produces a lot of sulfuric acid, enough to literally destroy the environment. I and mean, if you would have dumped that stuff all out now one time, it almost did. And so what happens is that is the industry has a trade market. You can actually get online and bid on these stuff. And you can bid on other people's trash. You can, you'd be surprised at stuff that ends up as hazardous waste, like chairs, automobiles, you know, excess petrol, uh, uh, oil tanks. I mean, weird stuff. And of course, sulfuric acid. So what happens is the petrol companies make a deal with other entities that use sulfuric acid actually as a starting product or to do cleaning or stuff like that. And they make use of it and they can sell it for a reasonable price that encourage it to, to be sold. You don't want to price it too high because then nobody would buy it. So they encourage the sale of it. So reuse is very important and recycling of that material. And I know when I was in industry, a lot of times what we do is we take a solvent and instead of just tossing it out because it was a hazardous material and was expensive to get rid of, we just cleaned it up. We distilled it. We filtered it and distilled it and reused it over and over again. That's part of reuse and recycling. Another thing we do, and our college actually does this, is um, we can treat it. That means you make it safer. And um, so like at the college, when we wash stuff down the drains in the science labs, it goes into a pit, a cement pit that we add chemicals to and it makes the harmful materials much less harmful to the point where they can go into a sewage treatment system. That stuff that can't, we don't pour down the drain, we put it in a container and sip it off to a company that then has the skill to neutralize it. And then we can dispose of it in the trash because it's not harmful. Um, biodegradation and what's called bioremediation is a very important one. And um, this is where we can use microorganisms, chemicals or plants um, to break down in, in a way, eat that toxin because some creatures do eat toxins and make it into something that is neutral. The last of things to do with hazardous materials is disposal because it ha hazardous material disposal is limited and expensive and nobody wants one in their neighborhood particularly uh, hazardous waste, landfills, incinerators, injection wells. So there are several ways that we can get rid of hazardous waste, which we'd rather not. And that means putting a very special landfill, which is on its own. It's not like a city one, municipal one. We could, in, we could actually uh, um, inject it into the ground, into old spent mines and stuff like this. This is done or into expend, uh, uh, old aquifers or we can incinerate it. I know Corpus Christi does this. Some of our hazardous materials that we get rid of in the labs at the college, we incinerate because it's a very special type of incineration. Uh, um, there are several types of incineration, but most of it's very hot and in some cases plasma, which is used a lot in Europe. 
because they can actually not only dispose of the material that way, but reuse the contents of it. So what we hope to do as a society is to um, uh, basically prevent. You can prevent hazardous materials from getting into the environment. So last but not least, if we can't do the top of that pyramid and we're stuck with the very bottom, how do we dispose of this stuff? And you have nothing better to do over break, go to a place called Freedom, Oklahoma. It's right along uh, the western, central western part of Oklahoma, and there's not much out there. And Freedom is easy to drive by. You will probably pass it up several times before you notice the sign. You will see a lot of dead armadillos on the road, a lot of mesas, and whatever. They have a huge hazardous uh, uh, waste facility, a lot of it because of the terrain and also its remoteness, but also because the city wanted it because it's an economy. It's the only place out there that people can actually work if you're not into ranching or whatever. And if you don't want to drive an hour and a half to three hours to get to, I mean, to get to a, the next largest city. So um, there's a beautiful facility there that I used to take my students on a tour when I was a professor out there. And I've actually had students that were employed there uh, uh, as, as chemists or environmental scientists working for the facility and, and monitoring it. So this almost looks like what we do with radioactive materials and basically it's similar. We have to keep it cool, keep it contained, keep it embedded so that it can't get out. And if someone was to you know, drop a bomb on this damn thing, it will be bomb proof and the chemicals not be able to get out into the environment. Because sometimes what they do with these drums is actually mix the chemicals with molten glass and mold it into uh, little marbles that then trap the hazardous material. Or they can put it into cat litter because cat litter can hold on to hazardous materials and sometimes never let it go particularly oil soluble stuff, not so much water soluble stuff. So these drums go in a containment unit in which the, if any leakage occurs, the leakage is collected and never goes out into the environment. And even if it does get out into the environment, there are monitoring stations all over that monitor any water that might be around or underneath that uh, uh, um, unit and they monitor the soil. So if there's no water, what they'll do is monitor the soil to see if the soil has any contaminant. And that's what one of my students did. Uh, she uh, monitored the soil water and what's called the leachate that might get out into waterways because there were several uh, uh, bodies of water that might have, uh, I should say an aquifer that was underneath uh, that unit and also um, a, a couple of small rivers nearby. So they wanted to make sure that those did not become contaminated and if they did, they were gonna put a stop to it. These are very expensive lifetime units. And just so you know, is um, each drum is labeled with the chemicals, also who sent the chemicals there, who's the manufacturer of those chemicals. And then it's put in a certain section of this waste site so it can be collected later if something happens. And there once was a case where an automobile company was using a paint that they did not know had a harmful substance that should not have been mixed in another container. And what happened was it got put into a hazardous waste landfill and it was packaged wrong in a way because you don't want some incompatible chemicals, hazardous chemicals mixed together because the synergism could occur and actually become more toxic or actually explode the drum. And that could be a problem because then you lost partial containment. So what happened was um, they had to trace where that paint went and they eventually found it sitting in a certain drum in a landfill and they had to take that drum out, which was very expensive, re, uh, refill it, so, you know, literally you can do this. They separate the paint from something else, uh, the other chemicals in there, what they call the compatibles, don't worry about that, and, 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 and had to charge basically uh, uh, the, the manufacturer of the paint and also the car company for doing that because they couldn't, they, they weren't doing their due diligence. So this is disposal. There, it's expensive, it's lifetime, and not everybody wants one. So these are very far and few. And I hate to say in developing countries, they don't build this type of stuff, unfortunately. We, they don't have the money, and sometimes they just don't have the policy to do that. Uh, these facilities are very similar to the ones in Europe, Canada, whatever, and some major cities. So on that note, we are done with hazardous materials. Please read the book.
and uh, do the associated assignments to go along with this. And if I have any questions, again, email me and not so preferably leave me a voicemail. Bye.